So, when I started thinking about who has had some of the greatest impact on the global vision of what health and wellness and empowerment looks like, this person's name came to mind first. Brooklyn, please welcome our WW 2020 Visionary Conversation, the former First Lady of the United States, Michelle It's fun, eh? It's fun. <laughs> Look at this. Look at this. Hey. Look at this for fun. <laughs> Woo! Oh, does, does this feel like Ooh, does no. this feel like deja vu all over again for you? Because <laughs> no, you were is... here wearing those bad Balenciaga <laughs> gold boots. Yeah, Barack is like, where are those boots? <laughs> He's like, what'd you do with those boots? I was like, they put away, honey. Just settle yeah, down. It's the thing. When you wear a pair of boots like that, you, 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 it's really like they go to the Michelle Museum, That's right? right. You know, you don't walk around the street in that. You don't, you know, you don't do anything with those boots. Yes. You barely get on stage in those boots. <laughs> but does this feel familiar? Oh, Wasn't this? It feels good. It feels know? good. So I know, 20, was 2019 your year or what? It was crazy. It was unexpected. Yes, it was a good year. It was. That's because Michelle Obama's book, Becoming, I know everybody in here has it. <laughs> it, 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 it wasn't just the best-selling memoir book of the year. It's the best-selling memoir of all times. <laughs> And what that says to me, I think it's like now 11.7 million, probably 12 since we've been sitting here, uh, million. <laughs> what it says to me is that it's such an extraordinary time mm. to be a strong, confident, assured, and above all else, well woman in the world today. Uh, absolutely. I mean, so many people saw themselves in my story. Um, it's also a time for owning our stories. And I think that's part of what resonated with people. Yes. I mean, a lot of people came up and said, well, you were so vulnerable. You, was it hard for you to tell your story, yeah. to tell your truth? There were things you covered that were difficult, like trouble in your marriage and trouble having, getting pregnant. Was that hard to do? And my response is, no, that's my story. I embrace every aspect of who I am because, as I've said, I like my story. I like all the highs and lows and the bumps in between. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that, you know, what we learn from that is people are, uh, they are, they gravitate to other people's vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. They, we, we gravitate to one another when we see the best and the worst in ourselves because it makes us feel human, mm -hmm. you know? And I think people connected to the humanness of the story. What happened that you could never have anticipated on the tour? I mean, you, didn't y'all do 30 cities? We did 34 cities. Uh, we did Europe, uh, you know, a tour in Europe. Um, but I think that, and I won't say that it was surprising because we're feeling it here, you know, is that people are hungry for connection. They're hungry for community. What's happening here is that there are people gathering together. They're moving outside of their individual lives and the lonely, loneliness that can come with social media obsession and Instagram worlds, we feel lonely. And when we come together in a space like this, you know, for whatever the reason, whether it's to hear about a book or to talk about health or to see Oprah, um, <laughs> it reminds us that we are not so unalike. And people are, are hungry for that. And it's that hunger, and I don't take any credit for it. I don't, I don't think, you know, I, I think we underestimate the, the desire for people to feel a connection to each other. I know, and all of the granted. people in this room paid money to come out to give up a Saturday, and we know all that Saturday means. And, and as I said, ain't nobody twerking on this stage, yep. you know? 
people are talking and having conversations, yes. but the, the current climate speaks down to people. You know, we think that people don't want to talk about books and talk about deep things and to, you know, really uh, be self-reflective. Speaking of the current climate, you know, one of the things that you have now become famous forever for is that when they go low, mm -hmm. we go high. And that ain't always easy, y'all. And it's not always easy. <laughs> and w what I wanted to ask you that, in this climate where mm -hmm. low has taken new lows, yeah. How do you maintain a high and not appear to be passive and not mm. lose your equilibrium because low is going lower? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Well, because going low is easy, which is why people go to it. It's easy to go low. It's easy to lead by fear. It's easy to be divisive. It's easy to make people feel afraid. Mm -hmm. That's the easy thing. And it's also the short term thing. And for me, you know, what I learned from my husband, what I learned in eight years at the White House is that this, this life, this world, our responsibility in it is so much bigger than us. Right. So what I have to keep in mind is usually when I want to go low, it's all about my own ego. You know, it's not about solving anything. It's not about fixing anything. It's about seeking revenge on the thing that happened to you. Yeah. And when you, as Oprah, you talk about purpose yes. and what it's all about. And my purpose on this planet is not to just take care of my own little ego. You know, there is a bigger purpose for me out there. So when I respond to something, I have to think about that light I'm trying to shine. What role model am I trying to be? What, what are the words that I'm going to say? And how will it affect young people who are looking at me? Which, That's the bigger picture that puts you in a position to think high. Because if you're thinking about the long term, you don't take the short term measure of getting even with somebody right here and now today because it makes you feel good in the moment. If it's not going to fix a problem, if it's not going to move the needle, then you're not going high. You're just being selfish. Yeah, I was going to ask you that because... You know, when you are the rock star that you are, and yeah. yes, and when you're filling stadiums all over the world, you're a rock star. Just take it. Just take it. No! <laughs> take it. Yes. So when you, when, when you are... Yeah. Okay, y'all. Not, not just rock star. Rock star, role model, world's most admired woman. When you are that, when you carry all of those titles, does that affect how you then make decisions? Is that now a part of what you think about before you make a decision or have an intention? I don't know that it's any different today, but I feel like I have a res when you I believe that when you are a public figure, I believe this, that when you have any level of, of fame or if you have a platform, I believe and I always have believed that I have a responsibility mm -hmm. with that platform. And I think about kids. I care a lot about young people. And I know that what we say, what they hear come out of our mouths, all of us, but me in particular, because they're paying attention, that it, it has a lasting effect. Um, and I am a mother, I'm a mother, I care about kids first. So I think deeply about what kids are hearing me say. So I, yes, I do, I take that very seriously. And I take the words that I say to children very seriously. You know, when I'm with a young person, mm -hmm. I want them to hear me I want them to hear, hear me see them. It's important for them to know that this person who's so famous and has this platform thinks that they are beautiful and smart and kind and good. Yeah, it's and what that I was saying meaning. earlier, that everybody just wants to know that you hear me yes. and that you see me. Yes. What's the best advice do you think you've given your daughters? Oh. Gosh, I give them so much advice. They're so sick of me. <laughs> you know, now that they're in college, I have these texting. Did I ever, did I tell you to remember little things like you are eating some green things, aren't you? Um, but what is a thing that over the years was a running theme in your house that you said over and over? That you know, you what I tell them is what I continue to tell themselves is that they have to walk their own walk. 
You know, they, they cannot define themselves by looking at each other or looking at me or their dad. They have to take the time to get to know themselves, give themselves a moment to figure out who they want to be in the world, not who they think I want them to be, not wh what the rest of the world says about them, but to really think about how they want to shape their lives and how, how they want to move in this world. Um, so I don't want them measuring themselves by external influences. And for young girls, that is hard to do. Oh, you know, yeah. That is a very hard thing to do. And everybody should understand that as a responsibility. It's Instagram it was culture. Oh, it, it, it drives me crazy. It was, hard when, it was hard with just cable TV when you're watching yeah. all the images and, and, and music videos. It's, I don't know, exponentially mm -hmm. difficult yeah. with, with, with social media when you're comparing yourself to everybody on social yeah. media. Yeah. So I constantly have to remind them that they have to live in their own skin. And that takes time too. And I try to make sure they understand that that, that unfolding of understanding who you are, it, it, it is a journey of becoming. You don't know it all in your 20s. No, you don't. You just start to know something, right? right. How did y'all do that in the White House where you have access to everything and everybody in the world? I think it's difficult for people, no matter where you are in your trajectory, you want to do, have a better life than your parents. You want your children to live comfortably. Everybody mm -hmm. does. But how do you not spoil children when they have access to everything? It, it was easy for us, you know, because we don't think they deserve it. You know, and it's how... <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't a difficult thing to do, you know, not, no. not the way me and Barack were raised. Yeah. I mean, first of all, you got to have a mate that shares your values. So it starts way back to who you pick. You got to have a good picker because if you all don't come to parenting, with the same kind of values and understanding that stuff doesn't, isn't parenting, giving kids things is not, parenting is a, it, it is a verb. It is an active, engaging thing. And that means you gotta know who you, your kids are and each one of them are different, right? So you can't just apply the same principles to the first one that you did to the second one because they come here totally different. Um, so we, you know, we didn't just show up in the White House, you know, we, I'm, Michelle from the south side of Chicago. I grew up <laughs> in a little bitty house. I got nice clothes and jewelry now, but my mother made my clothes, you know. I mean, we were raised with the, that's enough. You know, you be grateful for what you have. You don't look at the next thing. You be happy with what you have. And that's how we work in the White House. That didn't change because we moved to a different house. You know, the house didn't define us. It's the values that defined us. Amen, so, amen. For us. So I heard, we <laughs> read this, although, you know, we can't believe anything we read, but I, I know Malia's third year Harvard and you all, all together as a family dropped Sasha off. We did, we dropped Malia off too. Yes. Yeah, we all did. Okay. And I heard- With, the, with the motorcade. With, with the motorcade. <laughs> Tried to hide it, but it was there. <laughs> it's hard with 20 cars. <laughs> well, they, they, we had them do less cars. Okay. So it had to be How an undercover motorcade. How was the drop motorcade. off? It was, it, it's always good for any parent who's dropped off kids. There's the busy part of drop off, which is like, okay, all right. And I'm that person while Barack is like trying to put together a lamp. I'm like, girl, you cannot keep all these clothes. <laughs> You brought a hundred shoes and you live in a dorm. So you can, you can pick 10. I mean, this is what I'm doing. It's like pick 10 shoes. You cannot bring all those shoes. And she was supposed to do that before we got there, which was winnow her clothes down. But see, she didn't understand what dorm life was. And I was like, girl, you got three inches of a closet. So you got to figure this out. So there's that busyness of trying to move in and pack, unpack and fold clothes and clean Put out stuff. Put a lamp together. Get it all together. Um, and so when you're busy with the busy stuff, you're not thinking about the emotional stuff. So usually we then drop them off, get them in the dorm, then we take them out to lunch somewhere. And that's like our last lunch. And when the emotions come is when we are getting in our cars and getting on a plane and leaving our babies and they're going somewhere where they will now live. That's when it hits you. It's like we all start choking up. It was just, just like, 
this is the time when I know you're leaving. Yeah. And so we all, you know, try to hold it together. We tried to hold it together to get her in the car so she wouldn't start crying. And then me and Barack, we bawled like babies. <laughs> <laughs> You know, Barack has that, uh, gets that ugly, loud cry, like, <laughs> you know. He did that at, at <laughs> Malia's graduation. Like, we're sitting there, he had his sunglasses on, and, and speeches are happening, and, you know, we're all chatting, and we hear, <laughs> <laughs> and we look down like, are you okay? He's like, <laughs> <laughs> he's going to kill me for telling that story all of you don't tell them don't so, tell them so this year <laughs> is the first time you all have been empty nesters <laughs> and what's that like I it mean, is so is good it interesting? y'all is it mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. no it is really good because doesn't the actual energy of the house change yeah <laughs> it's good <laughs> No, what I'm saying is that parenting takes up a lot of emotional space. And, you know, my husband was busy being president, so I don't think he understood how much time time and energy. (laughs) Don't we wish, yes. Yeah. Don't we wish, yes. Just vote, y'all. That's all I'm saying, just vote. But anyway, we digress. Um, uh, But, you know, I I put a lot of time and energy to parenting these girls in the White House because we were trying to make their lives normal. You know, so that meant weekends were always a pain, right? Because you had to worry about what party they were going to, whether there was alcohol and who was doing what, and I had to know who the parents were. So you're trying to do that as First Lady. I mean, every weekend for me, was hard just following these little girls around. And they're gone, thank God. They are off living their lives. As my mother used to say, sometimes you you just need to get out there and live your life and have your mistakes where I can't see them because I'm tired of watching you walk into a wall. You that I told you them. was there. You don't follow them on social oh, media? Oh, no, no, no. Now we have a lot of people who do. You know, that was the... <laughs> no, I'm serious. We have my communications director. Every not... Gr- all the young people in our lives that I mentor, they all follow the girls. You know, they're, they're bigger brothers and sisters who are grown. It's like they're watching, and they, they're the ones because it's better for them to be checked by somebody other than me. You know, I also had to learn how to parent with a balance of kids who have secret service, right? So you, what what am I saying, right? You don't know what I'm talking about. (laughs) Right? You know, when there's secret service, you know how that goes. It's like, no, you don't, but, and neither did I. But you're trying to make sure that these men and women who are following them around, that the girls can trust. So I had to get my information about what they were doing or not doing just the same way everybody else uh, from other parents and other kids who will tell on each other. You know, that takes, uh, that, that takes some energy. And now all that energy I ne- can now place back on me <laughs> um, and figuring out my next chapter, you know, how I want to spend the rest of my life, what I want to do what, what I your choose 2020 to do. vision is and beyond exactly 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 so do you all actually now have do you have more time for each other to spend yes yes so and more t- emotional time really more emotional energy I mean it's just me and him and Bo and Sonny at dinner and there's only they don't talk the dogs don't <laughs> so we're looking you're at each other 28 right it'll be 28 this 28 year 28 years yeah now, that's real time. Your husband recently posted a message. You all see this message that he posted on Michelle's birthday on social media <laughs> and said, he said that in every scene, you are my star. <laughs> Aww. Aww. And you have <laughs> called him your soul affirming partner. <laughs> Is it more so now, 28 years? as opposed to earlier years? Does it just keep getting better or it's, it's more seasoned? It's... it's all of that, you know? I mean, and this is what I try to tell young people. It's, it's you know, marriage is hard um, and raising a family together is a hard thing. It takes a toll. 
But if you're with the person, if you know why you were with them, you know, you understand that there was a friendship and a foundation there, that may, it may feel like it goes away during some of those hard times, but it, it, it's something that, you can, that we always come back to. And we're coming back to that point where we see each other again, you know, because some of the hardest times in our lives, we just, we just escaped it. We survived it. You know, we went through a tough time. We did some hard things together. And now we're out on the other end, and I can look at him, and I still recognize my husband. He's still the man that I fell in love with, oh, I, who amazing. I value and I respect and I trust. He's been an amazing father through so much. Um, he, is, he, he, shows up, he has shown up well in the world, and it's, he has been who he promised he would be to me. And so that has been tested over 28 years, you know. So what I tell young couples is that you got to hang in there. You know, you can't quit the minute it gets hard because this, this thing of living life and building a life together is a naturally hard thing to do. So you can't quit when it's hard because then you'll miss the good part. And I do joke, you know, uh, and some people hate when I say this, but if you live long enough to be married for 40 years, 50 years, which is what we're working towards, if you get to a point where eight, eight of those years are bad, 10 of those years are bad, wouldn't you take those odds? You know, but that's what marriage is. You can have chunks of hard, bad times. And if that's how you define your marriage by just the hard times, then you'll miss the, 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 the truth of what's really there. So you were so open in becoming when you talked about it, and everybody was like, oh, they went to therapy. And therapy really was an eye opener for you and for him. Well, we all need to reflect. Um, and it's very hard to do it in a marriage with the person you're trying to work on. Sometimes you need an objective person to just hear you out. You know, you, you, you may not be right. You may just want to get it out. And, so and have you, him sitting there listening to you get it out. Sometimes that helps. It's like, I don't know if you What did it teach you me. about yourself? I talked about this. It taught me that I am responsible for my own happiness, that I didn't marry Barack for him to make me happy. No one can make me Whoa. happy, you know? So my disappointments were about what I thought he should be doing for me, giving to me when I hadn't really done the work to figure out what did I want and how do I go after what I want on my own? You know, if I'm gonna show up equal in this partnership, I have to be able to make myself happy. And so I had to stop focusing on what he wasn't doing and start thinking about how to carve out the life that I wanted for myself with or without Barack. And the more I did that, the more I succeeded in defining myself for myself, the better I was in my partnership. And isn't that for you the cornerstone of your own wellness program is defining your own happiness and working towards that? Well, one of the things I said, I said this earlier, what I tried to tell my girls is walk your walk. You know, that's been my mantra. One thing I do every year, um, I started doing right after the White House is taking a, a retreat. And I think some of the people, who, some of my girlfriends who've gone on a retreat, we go to this place where you're essentially walking for four hours. It is, it's hard, and my friends who don't know what it is are usually mad at me by the middle of it. That's that place where you get up at five in the morning. Exactly. And, uh, 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 and one of the lessons of walking for that long, because it's rare that you have to walk, and these are hikes. This is up mountains and down streams and valleys, and all you have is a camelback with some water and some hiker is telling you, water, 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 and you're just like, shut up. Just shut up with that water. When is it over, this hike? Um, but you're hiking with other people, and what you realize is that not everybody has their own way of hiking. Some people can get up the mountains fast. Some people are fast on the flats. Some people are slow and methodical about how they walk. And I always found that when I was not enjoying my walk is when I was comparing my walk to somebody else in the group. And I had to sort of start telling myself over these four hours, Stop comparing yourself to the person walking ahead of you or behind you. Walk your walk. Do your walk. Why are you here? How fast do you need to go? How, 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 how fast do you need to take that incline to get through it? Because if you do what she did in front of you, you won't make it. So for me, the message 
that I always have to tell myself is what is my journey? What, what is my definition of health for me? Not what I see in a magazine, you know, because the, the people in magazines don't look like us. They, they don't even set it up to look like us. They don't even look like that, right? <laughs> so yeah, I sometimes I'm at a photo shoot. You've, have you ever looked around the photo shoot? At last photo shoot, I counted 47 people. Oh, yeah, those are, those yeah. Are, yeah. This is also rich people's problems talking about <laughs> photo shoots, right? <laughs> And in my photo shoot, girl, girl, there were like 100 people. Girl, my last photo shoot, yes. <laughs> but I'm just saying, it requires so many people to make, to, you, to, to make to, you look like this, right? Yes. People, somebody put these bracelets on me, and then they moved one over there. And I was like, why'd you move that one? What did, <laughs> why that one? <laughs> but who's got time to figure it out? They just, they just push you out on stage. Just get out there. Uh, when, this when, is sort of my walk, but some, it's somebody else's walk, too, this when, look. When, when, <laughs> I was talking to Tina Fey recently, and she said that she, uh, she's at a stage now where she appreciates that she has moved through life in a few different body shapes. Mm, uh-huh, yeah, yeah. yeah. What do you appreciate most now about your body today? Mm. It's mine, all mine, and it's a healthy body that works every day, um, and I, I try hard not to judge it, um, and it is different. I mean, you have to get to know your body because what this body is at 56 isn't this, I can't do the same thing that I did when I was 36. It's not the same body. We, we are, we're living things. We're not machines. You know, we run out of gas. We need fuel. <laughs> we need sunshine and light. We have to take care of ourselves, and when you don't, as you get older, just like any living thing, it begins to uh, fail on you. Um, and for me, I'm trying to figure out what is that balance that I need to make sure that the, this body that God gave me, that I'm taking care of it the best that I can and that it will serve me well as I get older. And that is doing that, what I did at 30, does not take care of this body at 56. So I can't look at some little kid in the gym next to me and even want to walk her walk because she's 30, you know, and I'm 56 with a 56 year old body and I love my body, you know, and as a, as a, as a child growing up with a person, with a father with a disability who could not walk, my father would have given anything to have any one of my legs. For me to judge that, and not to just embrace it and be happy that I'm alive, moving, able to move. Mm -hmm. I have to tell myself, appreciate what, what God gave you and take care of that yeah, and, be, I, and be balanced about it. I and, like that you so freely speak the number 56. Yay, for me. Yay. <laughs> Because you, you have been around women, we all have, and men too, like, oh, I'm not going to say the number, and oh my gosh, I'm turning 40, and oh my gosh, I'm turning, turning 50. You never had any of that. We, we are so ridiculous as women, you know, we, we, we are working with, we were struggling with so much, you know, just the notion too. The other thing, we don't want to talk about our age, and then we want to act like we should look like we did when we're 20, you know? When I'm sorry, men, y'all can look any kind of way, <laughs> you know, and it seems to be okay. It's, it's, I, I told my daughters because as they're getting older, they start to judge themselves. And, you know, it's interesting when they talk about, well, I couldn't fit in my jeans that I had last year. And I said, but you're a whole nother year older. You're now becoming a woman. You don't have a child's body. That's like saying, you know, at 20, I'm really upset that I couldn't wear my favorite overalls anymore when I was 10. Yeah. You know, that's as ridiculous as it is at 56 to think that I should look like I did when I was 36 or for anyone to judge me like that or to judge a woman like that. We, we're, we're aging. Well, and we're our in bodies this culture are... where people are trying to stop it. Yes. And then you have all of these frozen faces. Yes. And let me tell you, when and you're in a photo any... line, now this is another thing most people are, when you're in a photo line and everybody looks the same, and you're like, didn't I just meet you? <laughs> no, like, nope. nope. Y'all just have the same lips. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, and the same forehead. 
Stop same... it. Yeah. Let it go. <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs> I just met you. No, I didn't. <laughs> But we have to embrace our, our change. And I'm, I'm lecturing to myself truthfully, ladies, because I, do, I struggle with this too. You know, I struggle with looking at the mirror going, mm, well, 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 oh, and I hate, I hate looking at myself. I hate listening to my voice. I hate watching myself on tape because I'm constantly judging myself too, just like everybody else. Really, are you still, I was going to ask you, is there any self-doubt left? Yes! I remember... Uh, when, because I, I opened uh, or interviewed you at the very first tour stop in Chicago. I remember and that. And we were yes. a little nervous. We prayed backstage because I was the first one. Mm -hmm. And I remember you were anxious. And I read somewhere where you said you weren't even sure people would show up. Yeah, exactly. It's like, you know, I've, I lived in a cocoon of the White House for eight years. I knew sort of kind of that people maybe sort of liked me. You know, might, might be interested in the book. I don't know. You know, the people who had read... You guys, I say I wasn't really... I wasn't fishing for a compliment. Not everybody likes me, though. You know, some people think I'm the devil incarnate. You know, I mean, you know, when you're in, the, in politics, you get the good and the venom, too. You know, and that's why in the book I remind people, look, people called me all kinds of things when, when I was when I was campaigning for Barack, when it was a competition, they called me un-American, and this stuff sticks with you. Men talked about the size of my butt. You know, there were people who were telling me I was angry. You know, you, that stuff hurts, you know? And it makes you sort of wonder, what, what are people seeing, you know? Yes. So that, that stuff is there. And look, I'm a black woman in America. And, <laughs> you know, we're not always made to feel beautiful. <laughs> you know, we're, you know, so there's still that, you know, there, there's still that baggage that we carry. And not everybody can relate to that, but yes, there is baggage that, that I carry just like anybody else. Well, I was wondering if touring the world, mm -hmm. filling arenas and stadiums around the world helped to release some of that self-doubt. The release doesn't come from the adoration or the, the book sales. The work is still from within. That's the thing, you That's know, the it's, thing. That's it, the thing. it is, it's the voices in my head. It's not y'all, it's me, you know? It's me changing the, the playbook, the, 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 the recording in my head. That, was, that has been played over and over again. And that's what a lot of women, a lot of you, that's why I take, uh, take what, what children hear from me. You know, I take that very seriously because my voice becomes the part, that, the recording in their head. So and what could that voice possibly be saying to you at this point that brings self-doubt? It's always, are you working hard enough? Is there, you know, are you using this platform for a good purpose? Are yeah. you focused on what other people need? Are you getting outside of your own ego? That's, you know, we're, we're constantly checking that with the work that we're doing. I mean, I just spent a year on a book tour talking about me. And it feels like that's enough. Now let's talk about somebody else's story. Now, where, where are these girls who are not going to school? Because you know what, in the end, that's why I'm here. I'm not here to talk about my story or to talk about my journey. I'm here to shine a light on other young women. Who and that's your big same. work ahead. That's the big, I feel, that's, yes. the, that's the work that speaks to me. You recently released a companion to Becoming. It's called The, the, the Journal. Lovely for discovering your voice. I gave away many for Christmas. Thank you. Uh, and I've been keeping a journal, you know, since yeah. I was about 15 years old. I love some of the questions you include in here. You say, if you could have a conversation with a loved one who has passed away, what would you ask him or her? I'm asking that of you. Mm. You know, I, I, I wish I knew, like, I, I, I wish I had taken the time to get to know my grandparents' full stories because a lot of what I talk about are, are my impressions of what my grandparents must have been going through. I talk about my uh, paternal grandfather, Dandy, um, and he was kind of a crotchety old man I write about, and now that I'm older, I can look back and think, why was he so angry? But it, 
it was because he was a brilliant black man in the era of segregation and Jim Crow who could not realize his potential. And he was probably very bitter about that. Yeah. And, imagine and how that would feel. Imagine how that would feel. I wish I was old, I, I wish I had been old enough to sit down with him and ask him what, you know, what he went through. How did he, how did he survive uh, living through a world that had such limited expectations for him when he knew that you know, there was so much more for him. Yeah. I, I would want to unpack that yeah. so that I could get to know him better. And the reason why I put this kind of stuff in, in the journal is because this is what our stories are. And I want particularly young people to know that there is time now to have some of those conversations with the elders in your life. Because the more you understand their stories, their journeys, their pains, and their hurts, you get to understand who they are in a full sense. And then you judge less and you're more empathetic. Um, I, I wish I understood my elders a bit more, but we grew up in an era where you don't ask nobody a question. You know, don't ask Dandy that. <laughs> right. You know, you're, you're, but you wish if you could have a conversation, that's who it would be. And All I right. would do that with every single one of my grandparents. Describe your perfect day, beginning with breakfast and ending with dinner. Mm. Well, we'd be somewhere warm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> We'd be in Hawaii, and uh, or someplace warm. Yes. And I'd wake up and have a workout. I'd be outside. I'd do get you do fresh breakfast? Air. Do you do breakfast? I generally don't. I'm not a big breakfast person. Yeah. So I, I I probably wouldn't have breakfast. I would go out on a long walk where I could see the ocean and some mountains, and I you could love feel to myself. Hike. I love to be outside it because so much of our lives we don't we don't have the freedom to just be outside anymore because of security. So bo both Barack and I crave a chance to be outdoors. And I would take a long walk, and I would come home, and I would have lunch with my husband, and I would sit on the beach, and I'd read, or I'd talk to some of my girlfriends because I love living in my community. I love to have people around. Our house is usually full of people. Do you still cook? No. <laughs> not a stick of cooking. <laughs> that is not one of the things that I need in defining myself. I don't need to cook. It's not on my personal list. Now, I know, Oprah, you like to cook. I, but, but I like no, to cook when I want to. Yes, I don't ever want to. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> like, I can make some hot water cornbread. I'm just cornbread being honest, some... I can cook. You can cook. Yes, I can. Because you did it for many years. I did it for a lot. I was like, proved it and cook for y'all. <laughs> you've, you've been fed by me. You don't do it anymore. No. And he doesn't either. <laughs> <laughs> no, he doesn't either. How do you look after yourself after a bad day? That's another one of your journal questions. How do I look after myself after a bad day? I tune out the world that is making me feel bad because it's usually something external. I just take a break from what's yeah, making me feel How much TV bad. do you watch? I watch TV, but I watch like... Um, I like HGTV. I want... I, you know, and I got into this habit because I never wanted to like get caught watching something where I would be mentioned or my husband. So that cancels out like most of the news, right? Right. So I you just don't, don't watch wanna... the news? How do you all monitor news in your We house? get clips and I watch, I, I get news on my feed and I kind of tune in. I have a whole communications team. So when something goes down, they will like, you need to see this. So I generally, and I had to learn how to do that in the White House because if you don't block it out, it can eat you up. I mean, so it can just- So if I come to your house, like the TV is not going to be on all no, over the house. No, like no. You go to Gail's house, all the TVs. Oh are yeah, on. no. All the TVs on. Yeah, no. Literally, so that when you go from room to room, mm -mm. it's on. In oh every no, room. that would drive me crazy. That would sap me of all that was good inside. Yeah. So you. You, <laughs> you, you don't. No. Watch, watch news. But what is your favorite TV show? Oh, God, I have a lot of favorite TV shows. I love Blackish and Grownish and all the ishes. I love, I love comedy. Um, uh, you know, I started watching uh, Schitt's Creek on Netflix. 
hilarious. It's kind of the takeoff on like modern day takeoff on Green Acres for young people. That was a show that was on a long time ago. A long, long time ago, yeah. So I like comedies. I love the um, marvelous Mrs. Maisel. I like that too. I like, yeah, I love TV. I, I love watching TV. I probably okay. watch a little too much TV. I wonder that I'm this. listening to myself. I was going to just, I, there's this question. Mrs. Kennedy uh, told a story a long time ago about watching a congressman's wife sneaking silverware from the, in her bag at the White House. So I'm wondering if you saw any uh, <laughs> weird behavior you witnessed at a White House event. Oh, God, yeah. People, you know, because people usually are nervous when they come to the White House. So, right. like, if there's a party, people usually overdrink because they're nervous, right? Because they don't know what to expect. But you can see, and the drinks at the White House are strong. So we have seen some people falling out <laughs> in ways that, and I'm not going to mention any names, of but... Course. You, you, I, we've seen some spanks and some, <laughs> some stuff. Okay, who's the most fun to sit next to at a state dinner? Uh, Stephen Colbert was a fun dinner date because he's so cute and charming and he's smart, so he actually knows what's going on, so. And he'll say things in your ear, you know, that are laugh, like, yes. stop it. We're not supposed to be laughing <laughs> at this time. So he was a, he was a lovely dinner date. And I, d I don't think he knew that he was going to be sitting next to me. I don't even think he understood why he was invited. <laughs> so he tells this story. He's like, and then he looked up, he looked at his wife, and he's like, I'm sitting next to Michelle Obama. <laughs> and I, he said all she, she said was, don't embarrass me. And so I like her. What's the last new thing you mastered? The last new thing I mastered? Uh... I don't know. Okay. That's hard. The last new thing I mastered. I don't, I'm, I'm drawing a blank here. Maybe I need to master something. I've just started yoga and there. Do you like it? I do. I do. Cause this is something I need cause I'm getting old. So I gotta be flexible. Gotta I think be able being to touch flexible is the most important thing. The older you get, the more important the it more is. Important so there are all is. these crazy yoga poses that, you know, like they w we went the day before yesterday and they were trying to have us do something where our chin was on the ground. They kicked their legs up and I was like, I'm about to talk to Oprah. I cannot have a bruised chin <laughs> that I have to explain to people because I'm trying some stupid yoga pose. So I was going to ask you, my next question was, what is the last thing that you did that made you feel genuinely older? Oh, any conversation with a young person, you know. <laughs> Here's one just personal sentiment. I have a godson who, you know, is just got his permit and his mother sent me a video of him behind the wheel and that just tripped me out because I was like, no one should let that little boy drive. <laughs> He's on the road. I mean, he was the kind of kid, like the girls would go over his house when they were little and they'd come back with scratches on their face because he was a wild little boy when he was little. And I would come home and it's like, oh, you must have been at, we call him Booch, you must have been at Booch's house because your face is all scratched up. <laughs> He's driving. That made me feel old. Seeing the young people in my life becoming adults. Who used to adults. be like this. Now. Yes. Yeah. Watching them out in the world, you know, buying groceries, having conversations about life like they know something. <laughs> you know, that makes... You know, the thing about young people, though, it's like their baby comes out, you know? It's like my children can be all elegant and saying interesting points and then I get a FaceTime because somebody doesn't know how to get a stain out of their duvet cover. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, you're still a baby because <laughs> you don't even know how to do laundry right yet. So, <laughs> but that kind of stuff makes me feel old. I was asking uh, earlier, Julianne was out and she was talking about her superpower is dance. Mm. What is yours? <sighs> Um, I don't, you know, I have a hard time thinking about it as a superpower, but, you know, I, I hope it's making people feel seen. You know, I hope that that's my superpower, that I, I, I make the people that I come in contact with feel seen and heard, especially young people. I hope I have that power. 
to make them feel relevant and whole, you know, and, and de deliver to them what I didn't have when that what was that when I was that age. Like the sense of of importance and relevance in the world. I I hope that's my superpower. Yeah. I hope my superpower is empathy. You know, I I try very hard, even in these times, to understand what people are going through when they're angry or hateful or when they're doing things that just don't feel right. I try to stand in their shoes and say, there's got to be something, there's got to be a context that I can understand that helps me see how you see the world so that I can connect with you on some level. And I think that's one thing that's missing in all of us, you know, is just the ability to stand in somebody else's shoes and understand their pain, their hurt, their yeah. fears, yeah. their loss, yeah. um, and to see them beyond their anger. Yeah, I think empathy is your superpower. And I'm also wondering, like, every time we see you, I've seen you out since 2016, you look like, and so does Barack Obama, like you really discovered what living your best life means. <laughs> it seems like you all took living your best life to a new level, have you? You know, we're, yeah, I mean, we're, we're happy people. Um, but I, you know. Did you get happier oh, yes. leaving the White House? Yeah, you yeah, I mean, look, there's, it, it was an honor to serve. I mean, it was, it was the, the biggest privilege of my life to serve as this nation's first lady. And I will, and I will continue to work to try to be a person of service, to try to make sure that my life means something to somebody else. But those eight years were hard. I mean, it's a hard job and it takes a toll. So anything after that, <laughs> It's like, they look really happy. And it's like, mm, yeah, because it's, <laughs> because it's not that. Yes, because it's not that. Uh, so yeah, we, we are happy people, but why wouldn't we be? We have our health, you know? We have each other. Um, we have a sense of purpose, you know? I mean, there are things to complain about, he and I, but we, the two of us, we don't have anything to complain about. That's why we believe we owe so much because to whom much is given, much is expected. So I, I, I cannot sit up here and complain about my life. What I'm worrying about are the, are the lives of the people who don't have a voice, the people who don't have jobs, the people who don't have health care. The, the, there are so many people who are struggling with things that, so it, it, I, it, it is a hard thing to me to look at the life I've been given and, and complain about anything. So I know you don't do resolutions, but we are here setting the commitment contract for a better vision for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Do you have a vision for 2020 and beyond? Do you see it? Oh, for us as a people? No, for you, Michelle oh, for Obama. Me. Oh, for me, okay, good, that's easier. <laughs> <laughs> for me, the, the next phase of my journey of becoming is, is, is is really continuing to make sure that what I do has meaning and purpose to somebody outside of myself. So my vision is, in particular, is to keep helping young people to find and build and support that next generation of leaders to help them understand a broader sense of values that they can operate within, because I do think that we are short on that right now that our leaders are not paving a good path for what we want our kids to be. I'm just sorry to say that. I don't want to make this political in any way. But I think young people are hungry for something and it's time for them to step up and to take the lead because we're getting older and we need to move out of the way for them because they're going to have answers that we've never thought of. So my hope is that I want to empower young people I want to empower the next generation of politicians and community activists and teachers and doctors and lawyers. And I want, to, I want to be a part of laying out a set of values and principles that we can all be proud of, of this country. You know, honesty, um, you know, empathy, compassion, 
caring for others, and caring as you for said, the other, least of these. You said earlier, you, you've also made voter awareness a top priority for this year's presidential election. This year and every year. I mean, what I've said with voter registration is that this isn't something we can do every four years because we have to change the habit of people in voting. We're not, we're not in the habit of being engaged citizens. And that's not something you do every four years. Okay, it's a presidential campaign, get registered. No, we have to be talking about this every day. When we wanna do something in this country, when a company wants to market and sell something to us, they don't do it every four years. They do it every day, every minute, every 30 seconds. They are telling you what to buy, what to do. We need to do that with civic engagement because people don't understand why government is important in their lives. Because I always say government doesn't have a marketing budget. <laughs> it can't be on TV telling you what it's doing for you and your schools and your roads and your communities. So we start taking it for granted and thinking that this is all a game. But we have to be having these conversations every day every day, why it's important, why is it relevant, you know? And so, no, it's not just this year, it's every year. It's not just this election, it's every election. We have to change our culture in, in terms of our engagement in this political process. You, you, you've talked about being 56 in the shape that you're in. You work at this, though, every day. Do you have a wellness goal or wellness quotient for yourself? It is, it is balance and under, understanding my walk. I've got to understand, I'm trying to make sure I understand what healthy means for me, not compared to the person walking next to me, not the person in the magazine. I'm trying to understand what my blood pressure level should be and what my flexibility should be and what cardio means for me and when do I feel good because we can also overdo it, right? We can work out so hard and diet so much that we might be thin and look a certain way, but our bodies are broken inside uh, because we're not walking our path, we're walking somebody else's path. So I am trying to figure that out every day and it changes because women, our bodies change drastically in comp comparison to men. We're going through menopause, we, we've got a lot going on and I don't think we've done enough to understand what aging means for women's bodies. What are we supposed to look like? How are we supposed to feel? We're not talking about that enough. And I feel like we're at a time when women our age, because we do have, we do spend money. Now we have wealth, women our age, but the market and the fitness market, they don't speak to us. They're not catering to us. They're catering, catering to Malia and Sasha how this workout wear looks and what these classes are, they're catering to 20 and 30 year olds who quite frankly have no money. <laughs> how is that? So I, I want to make it, a, I want to push these industries to start thinking about us, women, mature women, so that we're operating with real good information about what we should be wanting. But for me, I have to figure out, in, in the absence of that information, I've got to seek it out for myself mm. and, and stop comparing myself to the woman next to me. You, you don't have to compare because you know what you represent? You represent what Maya Angelou said in one of her poems, you make me proud to spell my name, W-O-M-A-N. You. And when I see you walking, it makes me proud because you are a phenomenal, phenomenal woman. Michelle Obama! Love you, babe. Thank you, thank you. Michelle!